Hello. Thomas, how are you? How are the brownies? What's going on? You all right? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, I got one here now. Be, Classic. <clears throat> Just me and you, is it? I don't know where, where he is. A German, running late. Always. Efficiency shouldn't be his thing. <laughs> Here he is. Well, I used to be two minutes late. I was actually uh, 20 minutes early, Chris. Well, were you? The Mark Lambert timing, eh? <laughs> So, um, we, uh, I think we're just going to wait for maybe a couple of minutes. We're up to, so just so you guys know the way this works, you're only going to be able to see me, but there's lots of other people on the call. Um, so, uh, questions will be coming in, but we're at about just under 70 and I think we're expecting a few more. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes and then. Has everyone got brownies or? No, 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 just the, uh, the special. Just the special guys. You only left? <laughs> yeah. Again, uh, we'll kick off at 8.15, I think, so we'll give it another couple of minutes and then. Chris, show us your dog, mate. Dog's downstairs, mate, your bark. <laughs> wants my brownie, so. He's downstairs with the missus. Otherwise, it would. He's good on the camera. Yeah, he loves it, doesn't he? Um, have you guys got uh, any? You, yeah, you've got your phones. It's fine. No worries. What for? Well, I might. Uh, you know, it's me. So I might. You never know. I might spring a couple of little uh, little quiz questions on you. You never know. <laughs> Oh dear. Right. I think um, you're good to go. Okay, this is uh, this is a bit of a new experience uh, for me, and I don't know whether it is for Chris and Alex, but um, it's quite weird for me to be in an environment where I can see you two, but I know there's lots of people watching us. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for an evening's chat with um, myself and uh, Chris and Alex. Um, how are you, boys? Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Um, training today? 
Yeah, no, yeah, training today. So um, it was quite, a, it was an all right day, wasn't it? Well, well um, I think tomorrow is meant to be quite tough. So yeah, just resting up for tomorrow, I think. Yeah. I how's, think the, how's the old body doing, Robo? Feeling exactly that, mate. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's okay. The heat, the heat's a challenge. We're bringing training a bit earlier tomorrow. And as Alex said, we're doing a, a bit more game related stuff. So we'll be doing a live kind of three or four phases live and then having a bit of a break. So it's getting our, our bodies conditioned to doing it because we can run as much as we like. We can do all the weights. But in terms of actual rugby fitness, um, the live scrums, malls, all that kind of stuff, we need to start testing ourselves ready for two weeks' time. Um, but yeah, there's like Dom is there and there's a lot of young lads around uh, keeping me fresh, keeping me infused by it all. Um, but you know what? The sun always helps getting up early. And you know what? Playing rugby also, um, when you're not playing every week, your body feels a million dollars. It's amazing what rugby does to it. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Um, yeah, it seems a distant memory to me already. So, uh yeah, don't miss the live scrums tomorrow. Uh, enjoy that. Um, you games, Lammy? You keen sorry? For, you keen for any charity games? or Am I keen for charity games? <sighs> I don't know. It's all a bit fresh in the memory at the moment. Um, uh, never say never. Never know. Um, right, so, I mean, the, the, the main format this evening is to take questions from the people here this evening. We've had a few in already. Um, but I just thought I'd... For those of you, obviously, all of you know know Alex and Chris as as uh, Quinns fans, but uh, got a little little rundown of Domers' stats. Um, Twenty three years old. Uh, John Fisher School. Then on to Cardiff Met, and then and then on to Quinns. Currently at forty four games in your two and a bit seasons, two and a bit seasons, yeah. Um, yeah. I've lost track now. With five months off, it doesn't. Yeah. Is, this, is this your second or third season at Quinns? This is my second season. Okay, it's good numbers. Good numbers yeah. for a season. Um, and also, well, portrayed as a lifelong Quinns fan. Um, yeah. Is that true? Yeah. No. When I when I was a young kid, I used to used to go to the stoop. Um, quite regularly to watch, to be fair. And I've, I've been to a fair share of big games as well. Um, the year before I actually joined Quinns, I was at the Northampton big game um, with my brother and a few friends watching it. And then a year later, I was obviously lucky enough to, to be playing against Wasps. So, yeah, it was a bit sort of surreal when you think about it, definitely. Your brother doesn't miss the game, does he? And no, nah, he's, yeah, they, they call themselves the Ultras, yeah. They, no, nah, they love it, to be fair, so, yeah. My brother, has, I think he's only missed probably two or three of my 44 games, I think. Yeah, he, he loves it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, if you, if you followed Quinns as a, a younger lad and stuff, um, without sort of embarrassing Robbo too much, given you guys play in the same position, must have been slightly surreal for you to be, to have the rise you did to then be coming into the club to play with the likes of Chris and, and the other experienced guys around. Oh yeah, definitely. I, you know, I used to, you know, without sounding cringy, but I used to idolise, you know, the likes of Robbo, Danny, you know, Marla, all of these players. And then, you know, I remember the first day going in, I was, I was very nervous and a little bit intimidated, I guess. Um, but yeah, to sort of rub shoulders with them in training and obviously in, in the change room. Um, so yeah, no, but obviously now to call them, you know, good friends and obviously teammates is. It's pretty surreal and you have to, you know, think back a few years where I was and then to be there now and like I said, be able to play with them is, is pretty special for sure. Nice. And Christopher, um, you've been around for a little bit longer than Thomas. Um, obviously went through Millfield and Wallingham and uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Wallingham. Um, and uh, joined the club in... 04, mm -hmm. um, without sort of going into a, a lot of depth because it's that's 16 years ago. Um, what are a few things that's that's changed the most for you over that period of time from when you came in as, as a fresh-faced kid at Aldershot? 
Um, what's the, I mean, a lot. You look at the, the training, we were doing that back then to compared to now. In terms of length of sessions, we were out there for kind of two, three hours doing the session, kind of ticking everything we could do in a, a rugby match. Um, back then, also, and I remember my first year, we had to change in the corridor. There wasn't enough room for us in the in the first team change room. So once they had they had gone home and we were in in the evening, we were allowed to change in there. So it's nice to have my own spot in the change room now. Um, but yeah, look, there was some great times then as well. I know we spent a huge amount of time, Lammy. We were both unfortunately very injury prone, especially early on, and I think we very much enjoyed it both on and off the pitch. Uh, we come in do our rehab, but also have a couple of good nights out as well, and probably. For us who didn't go to university, I know Domus has been, he's kind of had that bit of fun and a bit of kind of um, younger life, so to speak, a kind of rite of passage. And I think we kind of missed out, but we did catch up a little bit, which was fun. Certainly was. Um, and as Domus just said there, you've, you know, you've gone from those beginnings and the challenges you had early on in your career to now being in a position where I think, I don't think anyone would question in saying that you're now an icon of the club with what you've achieved at this point. And um, obviously we've got the, you know, the, the main memories, the things which we're, you know, we'd all say who were lucky enough to be around during that period, uh, the things we won and stuff, but maybe seeing as this is sort of a more relaxed evening, what about some of your uh, favorite off field memories during that time or trips we've been on or, uh, things that you'll you'll always remember yeah throughout the whole time that you you enjoy the rugby side of it you want to win you want to be successful but also it's about the away trips we play a lot of cards together we're not particularly good at cards but we have a bit of fun tease each other um and especially the european trips where normally you have to be in the country the day before if it's a foreign country um and then because it's normally a late game or a tricky place to get out of, you normally stay and have a couple of beers after. And I think that that kind of focus and that kind of camaraderie is, is brilliant in the sport. And for us to, to go away, and we had a lot of success away in Europe, probably not as much as at home as we would have liked. Um, but I don't know if that's just kind of focus our attentions. And normally after a night like that, someone would do something a bit silly. You'd be teamed for the rest of your career. And, and that's kind of that rugby ethos, which which in this day and age, we probably don't do as much as we used to do or as, obviously as much as they did back in the day. Um, but I still think it's got a massive part of the game because people let their barriers down, they let their inhibitions down um, and they relax a lot more, especially for new guys coming in the club. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, but we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on to the questions coming in a second. But And now you've made the decision to kind of move on and new era for yourself and onto a new challenge and um, a little bit about the decision to go to San Diego. Yeah, it was, um, it was a tough one for me. It was, uh, it's one of those ones where you just know in yourself, you know your body, you know your mind. And for me, who was born and raised this, this part of London, um, it was about trying to do something else and at least explore the option to live abroad. Cause I've always wanted to live abroad. And I thought if rugby can take me there, well, I'm still playing 80 minutes, uh, playing well kind of weekly. Uh, I wanted to try and explore that. Um, and I think the club have got fantastic people like Domers, Chisholm's, Web Lord, all these type of guys coming through the system. And it just it just felt the right time for me. Um, and I felt if I waited another year, I wouldn't get the opportunity to live abroad. And as much as I like Wandsworth, I hear Southern California is not a bad place to live. Um, I hear they train in the morning and go surfing in the afternoon. So, um, yeah, look, I think it's going to be a bit of fun. I'm looking forward to it. It's it's going to be a new challenge. So rugby, as far as I'm aware, is is not the standard we have here, which for me at the age of 34 isn't a bad thing. They play 13 to 15 games a year if they make the final, so probably half what you do here. Um, and, yeah, it's just it's more now about having a good life experience, I think. Yeah, perfect. And then um, Dom has obviously heard a little bit from Robbo there about what the journey he's been on at the club and um, and what he's what he's achieved and the way he's led the club in doing that in many ways. Um, what are your you know are you the sort of guy who sets yourself goals? Are you do you have two three things that you want to achieve or um, or do you just take it as it comes? Is there 
you know, you'd love to play this many games or do this or personal things or things with the club? Um, yeah, in a way, I guess. Um, I guess you never know what the future holds, but I guess ultimately for me, I want to play for England. And I think, you know, as a young kid growing up, wanting to play rugby is, is what every sort of kid dreams about playing at sort of the highest level. So that's definitely the big goal for me. And then, you know, when with the likes of Robbo and you see, you know, the type of, you know, club legend that they become and, you know, you want to try and sort of follow in their footsteps, I guess. Um, but yeah, for me, the ultimate goal is England and, you know, trying to consistently play week in, week out for, for Quinns and put good performances in. And I guess ultimately we want to win silverware. You know, it's been been a while since Quinns have, have got their hands on some silverware and I think everyone at the club's hungry for that. So hopefully in the near future we can get our hands on some. Okay, brilliant. Right, um, just a quick shout out. Um, at, at some point uh, this evening, we are going to auction off uh, one of uh, Alex's shirts that he got for his Player of the Month award in January, um, raising funds for the foundation. So thank you for that, Donners. Uh, we'll do that later on this evening. Um, we're going to go to some questions in a second. Oh, just quickly, uh, Nikki, who I think is on the call, um, she very kindly sent us all some brownies. Now, I'm obviously uh, there. See, there we go. Um, Nikki, if you're on the call, thank you so much. Uh, she's been a brilliant supporter. Thank you. For a number of years now. Short and Sweet Bakery, boom. Get your, get your orders in. Top reviews. Um, so before we go to the questions, because for those of you... Um, that have spent any time around the club of which I'm sure the vast majority of you had or have. Um, I'm re renowned for liking a bit of a quiz. Um, <laughs> I used to run quizzes for the boys um, in the, in the physio room and in the team room and stuff. So um, this is just going to be, this, this is just going to be very short and sharp um, just for you guys. Cause no one else can, I mean, you can play along. But this is just for you guys to have a little head to head. The winner can you can just eat some more brownie. It's fine. Um, so I just got I just got four questions for you. They're all to do with sport. It's all going to be pretty pretty easy. But um, uh, so we'll kick off with who has more tries for Harlequins, Alex Donbrandt or Chris Robshaw. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bear in mind that Robbo's played two hundred and ninety two games and Domers has played forty four. I'm going to go myself. I'm going to back myself. I think I must have, surely. How many, how many, how many do you reckon you've got? Me, not, not many, but I think if Thomas has played 44, surely he's not scoring one every game. No, nah, I don't know. Exactly. Nah. One every other game, sorry. One every other game. And I reckon I must have averaged two a season, surely. I reckon it's close, you know. Yeah. It is very close. So who, who are you going for? Are you going for your, you're, you're each going for yourself, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually Chris. Chris, 24 tries, but Domas, you've got 21. 21 Ooh. in four, four games. Oh, you know what? I've scored three this year. I'm in prolific form. Not that anyone's asking, but I scored six in 251. So... Um, <laughs> your try scoring is uh, significantly better than me. Um, would, have been one, would have been one more in the Prem Cup semi-final if you didn't drop it on the line, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> giving him nightmares, that one. Don't start. That was brutal. <laughs> um, okay. Um, question number two. Thomas, I hope you both get this. Um, you uh, famously went to uni at Cardiff Met. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, most famous moments in uh, English cricket. Uh, two, two batsmen held out at the end of the 2009 Ashes at, in Cardiff to secure a draw against Australia. Can you name those two batsmen? Yeah. Thomas or me? Uh, write it down on your phone. I think I've only got one of them. I've got both. I hope I haven't got this wrong. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, 
Okay. And the answer is? Don't bother. Monty and Hoggard. Monty and Jimmy Anderson. Monty and Jimmy Anderson. Oh. Two all. Two all after two questions. Two, what, one. what a day. What a day that was. Yeah, it was class. Um, okay, so everyone's been watching The Last Dance um, about the Chicago Bulls um, and the final season of that dynasty. Um, what year did Michael Jordan win his final championship with the Chicago Bulls? 1997. I mean, 96. 98. Oh! Yeah. Okay, so final question, and this is actually perfect, as if I planned it. Um, Dom, as you're a proper Crystal Palace fan. Yeah. Like a Red proper army. Robbo, yeah. you're not a proper Arsenal fan, but you claim to be. Back in the day, I think I was, but. And so, and I so I've given second team actually. <laughs> and so I've uh, I've given you a question here, which reflects a one proper fan and one not that proper fan, because your your side of the question is a lot harder, Thomas. Oh, okay. So can you can you name the top three goal scorers in Premiership history, Dommers for Crystal Palace? You write them down on your phone. Um, and Robbo for Arsenal. Be bearing in mind, Robbo, that the, the goal scorers for Arsenal have scored 175, 104 and 96. And for Crystal Palace, it's 36, 27 and 23. <laughs> <laughs> no loyalty there, is there? Don't hang around. <laughs> they don't hang around in the Premiership, that's the problem. In the, when Palace were in the Premiership, just Premier League goals, yeah. There's a couple of pretty current players on there, Thomas. I'll give you a clue. Just going to eat a brownie while I'm waiting. Why wouldn't you? Are you ready? This is tough. This one, right? Robbo, you go first. Henri, Wright and Burkamp. That's two out of three. Burkamp's wrong, isn't he? Henri, 175. Ian Wright, 104. Robin Van Persie, 96. Um, I've got Zaha. And then I've got Jordan Ayew, but it's not him, is it? I've gone Zaha, Townsend, Jordan Ayew. No, Zaha, number one. Yeah. Mill of oh, of And course. Chris Armstrong, played in like the 90s. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Done, well done, Chris. The experience that... Uh, right, okay. That was just a little bit of to get everyone a bit relaxed. So, we'll uh, I'll stop talking now, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna fire in some questions from um, the, some that are coming through on the chat, and some that we had in in advance. So, um, uh, from uh, from Andy from Andy Donerkey, um, and we've got to do this one first because he he says uh, as I get ready to jump out of a plane to raise money. Uh, for Macmillan and the Quinns Foundation, so good on you. Um, are players banned from extreme sports as part of their contracts? And what extreme sport would you fancy doing most? Well, the short answer is you're not meant to do any, any extreme sports where you could get injured, um, which may stop you from playing rugby. So basically, yes, it's in our contract that you can't go and do anything stupid. But... Um, what extreme sport would you uh, would you go for, lads? Um, yeah, anything the club don't find out about and you don't get injured, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to bungee jump. I've never bungee jumped. I would like to do that, like obviously properly. Um, yeah. 
I've seen some though, and I'm, I just don't know like about that bungee jump thing. I can't uh, see you out, Thomas. There's one. Where's that one where they off off that big dam, isn't it? And like James Bond. Oh, <laughs> nah. uh, maybe snowboarding for me. Okay, I reckon. Nice. Yeah, do a few tricks, but nothing where it like involves heights and like dropping and or climbing. I think that's not me. So in in the past, I'd have said whitewater rafting, but then I went whitewater rafting with ex Quinn's captain Will Skinner in Costa Rica about ten years ago. Uh, he nearly killed me um, because we got five minutes from the end, and he said, "Oh, we haven't come out yet. You're meant to fall out when you go whitewater rafting." And the guy's like, "You're not. You're not meant to fall out. That's not the point of this." Um, and we were going down some rapids, and Skins just knocked me out of the boat. Um, and jumped out afterwards and uh yeah i got sucked underwater for like over a minute and i genuinely thought i was going to die he's never apologized so um he's a good mate isn't he i'll never go white water after you again um okay uh okay this is a bit more of a this is a bit more of a psychology of a sportsman question presumably being a success uh, this is from hillary catchwell Presumably being a successful professional sportsman requires inner personal confidence. How do you balance that in a team environment? Um, do, some, do some players get it wrong and become arrogant? Either yeah. one of them. Okay. No, go on. You, you've got more experience in this area. No, I, don't, I don't think arrogance is a, is a bad thing necessarily as long as you, you deliver. As long as you you bring it every time, every day, whatever it be, and and you always turn up. Uh, but there's arrogance only goes so far if you're harming the team or harming others around you because of it. Then it then it needs to be checked. But but for me, it's a lot about kind of preparation. You're you're confident in your abilities. You're confident in in what you can bring. Or I find most people are. And it's about making sure they're, they're ticking. I, I don't know with Dommers, but if I've done the, the right things in the week, I feel confident. It doesn't matter who you're playing, you're confident in, in what you can bring in your skill set. Whereas all of a sudden, if you haven't trained a week, you've been injured, um, you might only do a, a light job the day before the game, and then you're a bit nervous because you don't feel quite as, as ready as you should. Or I do anyway. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, yeah, with self-belief, I think, you know, come game day, I think as long as I'm, like Robert says, confident in everything that I've done in the week to make sure that I'm physically and mentally prepared for the game, then I, I have that self-belief and self-confidence that, you know, I have the ability to go out and perform to, to the best. So, yeah, I just think self-belief is really important. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'd agree. I'd agree. And I'd, I'd echo what Robbo said, that the moment that becomes harming to the team, that's when you've got a problem. But I think we've all played with uh, plenty of pretty self-confident players over the years, and they've uh, they're a lot of them are pretty good. Um, merging two questions into one here, basically, sort of a question around the impact that the fans have, and obviously, there's, you guys are going to be playing in pretty exceptional times in the next couple of weeks, and and um, playing in front of empty stadiums, which I'm sure is going to be going to be a strange one. Uh, but when the fans do come back in. Um, what do you what do you guys feed off most from the supporters? Um, what do you think uh, the fans could do better for Quinns? Uh, is it louder? Is it songs? Is it whatever? Really? I mean, I suppose. Um, yeah, I suppose first and foremost, it's going to be pretty strange to be playing in front of empty stadiums, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I think yeah, it's almost like you're going to be playing sort of. Training matches, it's almost going to be like quite similar to training. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, you, it's going to take every team some time to sort of adjust to. Hopefully, I think it's going to be what team sort of adjusts the quickest to the sort of environment that we're playing in. But in terms of the other part of your question, for me, I just love it when it's noisy, you know, I'd like, you know, the singing, shouting, the more noise, the better. That's what, you know, I think excites us as players to sort of go that extra, you know, five or ten percent to give that little bit more when we're hearing the stoop bouncing and everything. So, you know, I just think the noisier the better for me. Um sorry, I'm I've got this on uh 
this is this is this is me trying to get up the uh, the Technology. question. And um, yeah, while well, while you're sorting out, let me also say yeah, it's that uh, you come into the stadium, you see the crowd, there's an, a real electricity about it, there's a buzz. Um, and I think definitely, like Dom said, for the first first game or two is is going to be very strange, but strange for both teams because you think about the lift the crowd give you that extra bit of energy to get off the floor a bit quicker to work that bit harder back because they're cheering or or vice versa um it, it is going to be strange and a lot of us won't have played in in stadiums like that with absolutely no one because even when you play second team there's still probably 500 people to a thousand people there and there's an atmosphere and all that kind of stuff but to have just the benches and probably i don't know maybe 20 other people there doctors coaches um ambulance service, that type of thing, is it is going to be very surreal. And that's why tomorrow we're going to the Stoop. I think next week we're doing a couple of big training sessions there as well to try and get that, um, get it used to it. But again, like Alex said, it, the, the players love it when it's noisy, there's a buzz, and it's very much a chicken egg thing. We know as players that we have to play well and deliver and score tries and all that kind of stuff to, to get the crowd excitement. Um, <laughs> and the crowd have to do their bit as well to continue with that. So yeah, it's uh, but yeah, when the noise is there, it's a brilliant place to play. I was going to say, mate, it's a sign that you've had a successful career that you don't know what it's like to not play in front of many people. <laughs> <laughs> so, some some of us have played plenty of A League games, mate, with uh, one man and his dog watching. So it's uh, it'd be like one of those for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, yeah, when you're used to a full twist, most of it's different. Um, uh, okay, I'm just going to scroll through some questions here that we that have been put uh, put in for us, and kind of just go through them. Um, well, I suppose I suppose you guys have um, have mentioned it there, but uh, what what are the ambitions at the club for the remainder of the season? Um, what what do you you know? What can we expect from Quinns and what are the squad hoping to achieve? Yeah, you know, we, we want to get in the playoffs. That, that's been our, our goal all season. I know we, we we slipped up a couple of games this year for for whatever reason. Um but yeah, that's that's still very much a goal and we want to hit the ground running. We know we're gonna play sale first game, but at home, uh big physical pack and, and we very much got booted last time, so we've got to right some wrongs there. Um, and then you go to a Sarri squad, which is a bit depleted with their guys on loan. Of course, they still have their X-Factor players. Um, but yeah, if you get a couple of good results early on, you get momentum. And especially in a strange time where does almost home and away form go out the window a little bit? Who's got the more kind of the stronger mental strength to, to deal with playing in stadiums with no crowds? It, honestly, it could affect teams so differently, as we saw in the football some teams weren't great beforehand and, and they came back and, and really excelled. So, um, yeah, look, we, we want to win stuff. And I know Dom is going to speak about the future uh, in the next couple of years. Um, no, yeah, obviously, like you say, we, we want to win silverware. I think, speaking for now, I think we're in a great position that we're in a bit of a unique situation where, obviously, sadly, some, some boys have obviously left us with, obviously, the timings of the season, but we've actually had an injection of, of some fresh faces, which has, has given the boys a bit of a boost, I think. And, you know, obviously for the fans that are going to be watching it on TV, I think it's going to be good to see some new faces, some new blood. So hopefully that will give us a little boost, boost to um, push on for this this final bit of the season. And hopefully, like Robert said, get into the top four and then who knows what can happen. Yeah, perfect. Well, I will be... Uh... I'll be watching along with everyone else, hoping that uh, you guys can go on and, uh, and achieve what we all want the club to achieve. Um, uh, from Richard, uh, if you had to choose any other position to play in the team, what would it be and why? I'm going to say, I, I, I don't know. I don't know for you, Robo. I'm, I'm not, I'm not back. Is it on your skill set or is it just like you could come back as another player? Uh, up to you, really. On your, on, on, your skill, on your skill set, mate, you could only move further forward. You could, you're, not, <laughs> you're, not, mate, you're not going into the backs. It's so. definitely skillful. Uh, I reckon you could get away at 12. No way. Domus could. <laughs> yeah, Domus yeah, could. He'll be all right. I could be a distributing 12. 
Yeah, I fly half, I reckon. I got a good kicking game, as the stoop I've already seen this season. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I like. I reckon I could do a job, job for the boys, kick the corners, <laughs> offload the ball to Paul CK and let him do the rest. I think. <laughs> well, then, Lammy, where are you moving to? Uh, mate, if I if I was born again in a different body, I wouldn't go anywhere near the pack. Like, yeah, Robbo, like we've spent best part of two decades um, kicking chunks out of each other every day in training mm. and you look at look at I mean forwards generally are better blokes but um, <laughs> like just the difference in what you put your body through as a professional forward as opposed to a professional back is it's just uh, it's well, almost a different game like you get a few of the guys a few of the a few of the backs kind of like resonate with the forwards a bit more and they feel like they want to get in with that stuff. And maybe 12s are a bit like that. And maybe you get a really nuggety nine, like a Charlie Mulcrone or someone who just wants to tackle people, but with just a different breed. I think you'd just go and, you'd just go and play on the wing, wouldn't you? Just right. easy. Yeah. I remember the session, and I'm sure the people out there remember, January and February this year was wet. It was cold. It was extremely miserable. And at, at Guildford, we trained on quite a, an elevated pitch, so it's extremely windy. And it, it must have been a couple of degrees, it was honestly freezing. The forwards went out early, we do our kind of our preparation and we do kind of our mauls and scrums before the backs join us. So we're kind of doing that, people are getting their toes trod on, they're shivering, they're kind of running around to, Matt Simmons is just falling over, someone's trod on his head. It was honestly an absolute disaster. It was one of those days where you hate being a forward. And then you just hear this giggling and you look behind you and the backs are playing football. And it was honestly like, yeah, two worlds apart. And it was, um, yeah, I, I remember that session just, at that point, I think my, my plane ticket was booked to San Diego for a bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like a good decision on those bleak days on a Tuesday <laughs> where you you get your foot stamped on in the first of 10 live malls and then you're just hobbling around for the next 45 minutes. It's not all glamour, guys. Um, a couple of questions coming in around the new players in the squad how they're settling in. I know that a couple of the guys are, are still to arrive, but um, Dom, as you said, that it's been been a good injection of energy, the new guys coming in. Yeah, no, definitely. I just think, you know, at the start of a new season anyway, when you have fresh faces, it just gives everyone, um, everyone a little boost um, and just sort of encourages everyone to sort of just give that little bit extra, I think. And I feel like it's been like that. You know, we've, I wouldn't put a number on it, but maybe like 10, 10 new boys, Robert, I'm not sure, around that. Um, and yeah, they've all come in and they're, they're all obviously looking to impress and I think they're all going to add add something that we probably didn't have before. So no, we're looking forward to seeing what they can bring to the to the team. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like you said, the South African guys aren't here yet. Uh, I think they're still waiting on English, English approval or something. But also, not just the new guys, but the amount of guys who were out injured have all returned. Marchand's come back from New Zealand and he seems hungry. Uh, Brown, Nathan Earl, uh, obviously a massive loss for us all beginning this season. Uh, he's come back looking sharp. Chris Ashton, I know we've all, of course, um, yeah, Chris Ashton's back there. We've not really seen him, um, but he looks hungry. So yeah, there's some some fantastic players. And like Don said, with the new guys stepping in as well, it does feel like a very new squad. And I'd I'd imagine for you guys it it um it almost feels like a new season, right? I'd have thought. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's a weird one. It's like you know when you asked me what what season it was for me, it's just like it's my second, but almost feels like my third in a way. Do you know what I mean? With we're almost calling like this like a, a mini preseason, and we've already done a preseason for this season. So it's um no, it's definitely a strange feeling. Um, but no, I feel I feel like for me mentally, it's been nice to sort of switch off. You know, during lockdown, it was quite refreshing at the start to sort of just get away from rugby and rest the body. Um, but yeah, I think now the boys are sort of chomping at the bit to to get back into some sort of normality and, and sort of have the games come thick and fast, which they are. I think we've got three games in eight days at some point. So no, I think we're gonna have to have to use the squad and, and rotate the bodies because it's impossible to play three games in eight days. So no, it'd be a good chance for everyone to get their shot and put their hand up. And there's, there's, a, question, there's a question here asking about um, bleep test times. And I know 
I know uh, you guys don't do the bleep test anymore, but you did. The Bronco is uh, is the modern the modern equivalent of that. Which for for those of you that don't know, is essentially you run twenty meters. You run from a line twenty meters and back, forty meters and back, sixty meters and back, and do that five times continuously as quickly as you can. Um, it doesn't sound that hard, uh, but it's miserable. Uh, I can say from uh, first-hand experience, it's miserable. Um, did you guys do that on the return back? Yeah, we did, yeah. But to, to our fairness, it was on the pitch, it was on grass. Usually we do it on 3G and there was a strong headwind. So we definitely added 10 seconds to our time. So whatever time you got, you were allowed to take 10 seconds off and that would be your time. That was sort of what we said between us players. And it was... Yeah, they were pleased with that, you know. If the coaches are pleased, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I love about that comment from you, Dom, is that you're still a young man in your professional career, but you're learning. Yeah. <laughs> you've, just managed, you've just managed to put in four reasons why the fitness result you got isn't actually the real fitness result. <laughs> and that, that is absolutely the key to a long and successful career, is um, being able to talk your way out of those situations where... You, you you don't do as well as you're expected to for some reason. Like Ollie Cohn made a career of that. So um, yeah. Well, we actually had big uh, for the fans. We had big Mo Fassabalu back today. Really? Um, yeah, he came back to see the guys. He's finally heading back to Samoa uh, with his family. He thinks it, it's the right time for him to head back that way. Uh, but yeah, he still looks. Um, I don't know if you saw him, Bodomas, but he's still a big, big scare. Big boy, and he, um, well, just came to see the club before he yeah, left. Just came to say, say hello, say goodbye kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it was lovely, lovely to see him. And obviously we shared a lot of time together. But what a, what a player he was for, for Harlequins. Yeah, I was going to say, Robo, uh, uh, it's not one of the questions, but now you've brought it up, what a player Mo was. Yeah, I mean, I think he was the most underestimated player we had, but the most effective. Yeah, yeah. Of, you talk about rugby being a very physical game and if you can get the physical upper hand you're halfway there and he nine times out of ten it was him getting it there running through brick walls time and time again and though he wasn't a flashy guy uh, but he's very very effective at what he did yeah so I think we we had a few messages early on in lockdown because I'm sure you guys would have all seen on social media Quinn's channel were replaying sort of clips of old games and even replayed a few few of our big full games in um in full on youtube and stuff and uh, the amount of like little highlights packages of on this day seven years ago and it's clips of a game and it's just mo <laughs> either with ball in hand or in in defense just ending people basically um yeah he was an unbelievable player i think they get a lot of a lot of games stick out for me but months are away in the challenge cup semi um, when he just, it, it was either chance or you never know with Mo whether he decided he was going to do it, but he made Ronan O'Gara's day a misery. He, do you remember they overthrew it like three or four times in the line out and he was just sitting at the back and he had three 10 metre run ups at Ronan O'Gara. Never <laughs> seen O'Gara so there going, ah. uh, yeah, he was an unbelievable player. And he's the sort of guy who's now, he'd now be in his early 40s, Mo, but I bet he still looks like he could go out and do a job. He could. I don't think it would last too long anymore. But no, it wouldn't last too long. In, 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 um, impact, 10, in impact 10. But also, he was, uh, he was so physical in the, in the game and in games. But in training, he was so gentle, didn't, didn't hit anyone. But I remember there was a young academy guy called Harry Sloan. He one day in kind of a shoulders on contact, so we just get a good grab, just properly whacked him. And you, you didn't do this to Mo. Mo, you were very respectful of Mo because um, he wouldn't do it to you. And then he just got up and <laughs> he said to this young kid, I'll remember that. And literally did nothing and people were like, oh, oh shit, what's going to happen here? <laughs> and literally three months later in training, he's just seen him and absolutely killed him. And he goes, I'll tell you, I'll remember. <laughs> that was it. And everyone's like, oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, he was, uh, honestly, he would save it all for games bar that one incident, I think. Well, uh, without, without spending too long on mode, there's just one of my favourite stories from a night out is... Um, when we beat Munster away. And so, as Robbie said, Mo's a hugely respectful guy, massively popular. Um, he's like a, he's a chief back in Samoa, hugely kind of 
respected culturally back where he back where his family are from and um no one ever really gave him any grief and uh we'd beaten monster away at toman park and we were sat in a big room in the, in the hotel having a few drinks before we went out everyone had put their, like shirt and jeans and whatever and mo came in in this in this pretty awful shirt it was awful <laughs> and it was <laughs> i'd like like shooting stars and stripes and all sort of stuff all over it and um I can't remember who it was. It probably would have been someone like Mick. Because well, he was head of court. Yeah, okay. Because Minty would have been the person who wouldn't... Nick Easter wouldn't have minded saying it. And in front of everyone, like, the room goes quiet and he just goes, oh, great shirt, Mo. And uh, <laughs> Mo just goes, what's wrong with this shirt? My wife bought me this shirt. It's my favourite shirt. And all the boys are like, yeah, it's a great shirt, mate. It's like... <laughs> It's exactly, it's exactly what I meant. It's a great shirt. Like, there's nothing wrong with your shirt. We love it. We all love it. I've never seen Mickey just so much. He just went. <laughs> and, yeah, Minty was like, dominated any room, was the alpha male, and just kind of went... <laughs> anyway, that was... I, whenever I think of Mo, I think of that. That was very, very funny. A um, uh, question from Terry, which is, obviously, it's a bit different, and... Um, back into rugby in August as opposed to kind of September, mid-September and a bit of a shift. Um, I, I, whether it's likely to happen or not is a different question, but would you, would you prefer to play rugby in the summer or are you happy having it as a winter sport? I mean, I, I'd, I'd definitely be open to the idea of, of summer. I think, I think if you look at, you know, when we were playing this season before lockdown, I think... I can't even remember how many games we played where it wasn't tipping down with rain. All I can remember playing at the Stoop was torrential rain. And I think, you know, for us as players, we want to play, especially at Harlequins, we want to play an attractive, you know, throw the ball about style of rugby where we where we can play from anywhere. Um, and it just didn't really allow us to do that. Um, and I think for spectators, they want to see an attractive brand of rugby and they weren't seeing that. They were seeing box kick to box kick to box kick sort of thing. So, no, I'd definitely be open to the idea. I think it can only build the game and, and get more young kids interested in it, I think. Well, you're, you're basically going to be doing that anyway, aren't you? And it's, gonna, it's, it's summer all year round in San Diego, Robbo. So, um, all right for some, isn't it? Suits my game, that. <laughs> I, know, I, think it was, um, uh, I think now, in all honesty, if, if they were ever going to change the league, Now's the time to give it a go. I know there's knock-on effects for junior and grassroots club uh, rugby. Can they water the pitches? Can they keep it safe? And of course, that, that's a massive factor. Of course, at the, the top level, we have fantastic irrigation and the water and all that kind of stuff, and the pitches are immaculate. So, And I think as at rugby at the moment, we don't have a perfect product. And I think that's the thing. We have, we have an all right product, but are, we're very stuck in our ways in rugby and we seem very old school. And if we do this, we might upset this. But I think you look at other sports and you look at their ability to, to try things and, and look, they're not always going to work. But I think now is a fantastic opportunity for us to, to do something. And almost if you do say, OK, we're going to give it two years. If it doesn't work, then we'll, we'll look to change back. Um, but I think, yeah. It would be fantastic. Like you said, with Dominic there, and I'm sure the fans were the same. Coming to the stoop this year was, it was miserable. You would literally wake up, it'd be hammering it down. It would like, it'd be final week, but for some reason, every Saturday, every game day, it'd be hammering it down. And um, yeah, it's not the best to watch. And it's also not the most enjoyable to play normally anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said, Robbo, but it's not happening. <laughs> Well, you know more than us, but, um, but yeah, exclusive. Mark Lambert says, <laughs> "Well, it's definitely not happening in the next year or so." So, um, uh, actually, we actually just got in a question, Robbo, when I made my uh, when I took the Mickey out of you about the uh, A League. How many A League games do you reckon you played for Queens? I don't have an answer, but you played a few in the early days. But I played a few, uh, but I was also injured a lot then. Uh, I remember going to, what was the police ground we used to play at? In the court. In the court, yeah. That was always a, a dark time trudging over the bridge. A soggy pitch. Um, that was uh, my only game time, mate. That was my only game time. Don't talk it. <laughs> I don't think I played as much as you, but look, it's, it's a rite of passage. 
uh, you need to do it. You need to put your time in, um, and hope you get a, get a break to to start playing. But yeah, it's, it's not something I I enjoyed it because you're with your mates and stuff, and you're trying to break into the first team, and it's exciting. And and more often than not, you probably go and have a night out in Oceania or somewhere after. Um, but look, it was um, it, it was fun. But no, I don't miss it. <laughs> No, there's not, there's not a lot to miss about Monday night down at Why I can tell you that. Um, Robert, you say, you say going over to, I think I, I probably know the answer to this, but a couple of questions around, do you ever think you'd come back? Well, firstly, do you have any interest in coaching? And secondly, would you ever come back to Quinns in that capacity? Um, do I want to coach? You know what, throughout my whole career, I, I didn't want to coach. Um, and I'm probably more open to the idea of mentoring than coaching in terms of advising and helping. I think with coaching, you have to be very diligent. And I think to be a good coach, you know, if I were going to something, I want to do it fully. I think to be a good coach, you have to love it. And I think there are too many people in this day and age who think it's an easy gig, do a bit of coaching, get looked after, all that kind of stuff, and, and stay in their comfort zone. Um, Will I come back to Quinns? I honestly don't know what the future holds for me. And, and with that, there's a bit of excitement. Quinn, look, Quinns will always be my home. And I'm sure I will return at some point. I just, I just don't know when. And, and even speaking to the club, like I said, I, I've been here as a, a boy and a man kind of the whole way through. Just, I just need to get away for a bit and just have a bit of a life experience, I think. Um, just, just try something new. And look, it might be for a year, it might be for two years or, or longer. And... I might go and hate it, or I might go and have a fantastic time, but at least then I haven't died wondering and been in five years' time, oh, I should have tried something. And that, that was at the back of my mind. To, to, it was more about the future and just expanding myself a little bit. Um, and also going to somewhere where, like I said, they don't play as much rugby. It's English-speaking, so I didn't really fancy France. It's a big physical league, French-speaking. Uh, I'm extremely dyslexic, so I think I would have struggled with the language. And I think to properly enjoy it, you need to. Um, but in terms of what the future holds post that two-year time, I'm not sure. But I will be back at stages throughout the year. Um, and I'll definitely pop back to the stoop for sure. Well, I'm, I'm coming out to San Diego. So I've already told you I'm coming for a trip. So, uh, it, it's, it's amazing, actually, how many people are willing to visit me in San Diego and not Wandsworth. <laughs> um, they're happily getting an 11-hour flight. But yeah, not in the... Well, not, 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 right, road. not right now, but maybe... <laughs> True. Maybe uh, when uh, COVID settles down. Um, Jack's, uh, Jack Sam has asked, which one of you is better at kicking? The answer to that is Domers. Um, okay. So we don't need to do that. Uh, Domers, you've gone from like really like big themes to I'll just ask you about food. What is your best uh, pre and post match meal? Um, well, I'll tell you what, at the stoop, so for anyone that doesn't know, at the stoop, they do a lot. We do fajitas, don't we? And like fajitas is like one of my favorite foods. So at the stoop, I always leave on a Friday before the game feeling quite ill because I just eat too much. Um, and we also have a lovely apple crumble and custard, which the boys love. Um, so we have a couple portions of that as well to make sure I'm, you know, fully, fully stocked up for the game day the next day. Um, but no, just anything simple, like a, a simple pasta is my favorite sort of, yeah. Little spag bowl, garlic bread. Just can't beat it, can you? Do you know what I mean? It's lovely. And then post game, <laughs> you want, right? Post game, it can be a variety of naughty things, mate. <laughs> you know that. I mean, I've been known to do lots of naughty foods, you know. Um, but pizza, I like an Indian. Um, mate, it, the, the list, could, we could be here all night <laughs> if, if I went through what I like to eat after a game day. But I, if there's one time you can have a treat, it's after game day. So. Uh, or, What's your favorite drink, Thomas? What's that? What's your favorite drink? Oh, diet coke with ice on a on a naughty day during the week. I stay hydrated on Robinsons. <laughs> if anyone has any contacts with Robinsons, we need to sort Thomas out. We're trying yeah. our best. We, I've, I've tried to get in contact with them, but no reply <laughs> yet. Work in progress. Um, R Robo, which. Uh... You've probably played at more, well, you definitely have played at more stadiums around the world and in different countries and across England. What would you say is your favourite stadium other than, well, other than the Stoop and Twickenham to play in? 
Um, yeah, look, they're, they're both fantastic. I think bar them, it, it's always fun going to Cardiff just because you know you're going to get a lot of abuse. They're very passionate. It's loud. Um, but you know what, Ellis Park, Ellis Park is, is special. You look at the history that's been there, of course, with the '95 World Cup and Mandela. Um, but there's something, South African stadiums are very iconic and they're not like any other stadiums in the world, but they have them all over South Africa. They're, they're very steep and they're very on top of you. Um, and when you go well, go to Ellis Park, you're kind of driving in the bus. I'm not sure many people are going. And you're almost going through like shanty towns and it's really run down and stuff. But you kind of just kind of weave through. And then this huge stadium appears and everyone is wearing green merchandise. They all have some in South Africa, no matter if they're kids or, or grandparents. They're all wearing something and you go there and you, you feel the passion, you feel the energy and um, the, the hope it gives, it gives people, really. Um, so that's always um, a great place. I've never had, I've never won there, unfortunately. But yeah, it's, it's a hard place to play as well because it's at altitude. So after about 10 minutes, you feel like you've played 60 minutes. Uh, but yeah. eventually you get your second wind. Yeah, that's, that's not for me, altitude. <laughs> we, we, we once did a pre-season camp at about Duez. But then we were away and that was, uh, did a couple of training sessions. That was, that was enough for me. Uh, hey, we were at the bottom of the mountain anyway. We were training <laughs> at the bottom. That's probably why I, I never played at Ellis Park, were we? <laughs> um, uh, Thomas, quick one. When you were at John Fisher, did you ever play against Whitgift? Yeah, I did. They were our main rivals. So, yeah, I did. Always a good game. Always a good game. Yeah. Um, we, uh, either one of you, what's your most treasured rugby possession? Um. Um. I mean, I played for the, the England Select 15 against the Barbarians last summer. So I've, I've still got, obviously, the match shirt from that. So that's probably probably up there. Obviously, it wasn't a cap game, but to play at Twickenham against a team like the Barbarians was a, definitely a special day and something that I would treasure for sure. Um, for me, I, I, I have some stuff <laughs> upstairs in my house, but I don't have a lot of rugby stuff out. But the one thing I have downstairs is my 50th cap for England. You have like a, a silver little cap on a plinth. Um, and yeah, that's very special for me in the, in the way I was presented and um, all that. Yeah. So that'd be mine. Nice. Um, uh, who's the biggest joker in, in, the, in the club? Marla, probably. Or, yeah, Marla or JT. Aside from Marla. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, Grazer. <laughs> Grazer's just a lovable idiot. Uh, I wouldn't say he's a joker. Um, yeah, I think just people just laugh at what he comes out with and what he does. Do you know what I mean? It's not not necessarily that he comes out with the you know the funniest jokes. He just says something and it's just funny. Do you know what I mean? Because he because it comes out of his mouth. You know. <laughs> um. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Uh. So Brownie's had a bar named after him at the Stoop. Um, if you could choose a bit of the Stoop to be named after you, either of you, what would it be? What would it be? It's one of the stands would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Why do you the whole stadium, Dom? <laughs> yeah, rename it. Yeah, rename it. Dom Grand Stadium. <laughs> Lammy, we were thinking to you to get you a bench, weren't we? Yeah, well, I think... I think <laughs> I think um, I think Terry might be on the call, and uh, I think the the uh, the seat in front of him, so our bench basically. I think they should, they should be retired for me. Um, I spent a lot of time on there. Me and Cole Dixon spent many a year sat on that bench, <laughs> warming it warming it for Joe Marler in uh, DC. <laughs> um, actually, uh, when I played my two fiftieth game, I. Uh, got a nice message from Connor saying oh congratulations 250 great achievement and I sent him one back saying thanks so much Connor just think if you if you played me a bit more I'd be on 300 by now <laughs> <laughs> you took it well to be fair um okay uh a couple of questions around March's trip to New Zealand and 
you've already mentioned that he's come back looking sharp, but do you think it's uh, the sort of thing which more players will look to do? And um, do you think it's a, it's a good thing for players to do? I suppose in, in a way, Robo, it's similar to what you're saying about your trip to San Diego, just in a very different context. It's a new experience, right? Yeah, but it, it is tough because, and I actually looked at it when I was a little bit younger. We, I remember how we had Gary Boter at the club. Um, South African hooker who was would always sing their praises of Super Rugby and say he should always go and do like a six month spell. But when, when you're trying to play England, you don't really have that opportunity, and you're kind of on the cross, similar to to where Dolmans is at the moment. You're kind of on the on the verge of it. You don't really want to pass on that opportunity because that 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 for me was my goal. Of course, it would have been nice to play Super Rugby or whatever and tick that off. But my goal was to play for England, and I think if you can give people experiences of course they come more rounded players and all this kind of stuff but but also I think in doing that coaches can go away and learn from these guys learn from the coach standard are they doing things differently can they bring some knowledge back um because you know it's like if you have the same coach for about your whole career and they don't evolve with the game you could be stuck in the same place so yeah look, I think it would be fantastic for guys to do However, I think the top guys, no matter what the age, will struggle to do it if they want to play international rugby. Um, I think March has obviously found a good opportunity. It wasn't great for us as a club, uh, but found a, a good opportunity to do it. That he wasn't quite in the England mix, um, but he kind of went and did it, and now he's back, and hopefully he can break into that mould as well. Um, we're gonna. There's still a few questions coming in. We're we're just we. We're going to go on for a, f uh, a few more minutes, but we'll sort of begin to start rounding things up. Just a reminder about the auction. I think a message has been put on the chat. Obviously, we're not in a position where we can auction it off with hands in the air because um, I can't see any of you. So um, if, uh, if anyone would like to um, bid on Alex's shirt, then if you could put it in the, um, in the chat. Um... Oh. Just a message. Oh, sorry. I just got a message from someone at the foundation. Um, yeah, if you could, if you, if you are keen to make a bid to support the Quinn's Foundation, we'd massively appreciate it if you put it in the chat whilst we're sort of going through the last bit of these questions. Then, um, yeah, hopefully we can raise some good money. And thanks again to Alex for donating. Um, while we're on sort of the serious stuff around career development and England. Uh, Robbo, what uh, what advice would you give to Domers about dealing with Eddie? Uh, no, Eddie, Eddie's fine, man. Eddie treat well. Eddie just you just got to respect him, and Eddie was always good to me. He didn't he never mucked me around. If he tells you to go work on something, go and do it. Um, it's like anything, and I always think, look, when you try and pick a team or when you try and do anything like that, it's a jigsaw, and you're a piece in that. And at the moment, unfortunately, Domus doesn't quite fit what Eddie wants. And he's not quite fitting into the puzzle. But I'm sure as things do, things change and things evolve. And he'll continue to work on his game. Um, and hopefully when he gets that knock, I'm sure he'll grab it with both arms. But you've just got to be patient. And I think that's the thing. It might be frustrating for Domus. You hear a lot of people singing your praises and whatever else. And he's been doing fantastic. But only one person really matters. Um, and you've just got to do what he fancies, no matter what this pundit or that pundit or... X, Y, and says you can't get drawn into it. You just have to go about your business, keep playing well, and and keep knocking on the door. And hopefully, it, when it opens, you you're ready to go for it. And not only to do it because they say that's it's easy getting there. The harder thing is staying there. And then once you get one or two caps, it's then going to get ten caps or twenty caps. And um, I've no doubt he will when he gets that opportunity. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um... Yeah, I think, I think everyone on the call would agree that uh, we hope that happens for you, Dom's mate. Um, seeing as you've got two back rowers on there, I don't know, um, I know, I know Robbo isn't necessarily an avid watcher of rugby generally. Um, you are? Do you? Yeah, I watch rugby every weekend. What? And you've done, and you've done so for, for years? Yeah, always. It drives the missus mad. I watch Friday night games most of the time. Well, there you go. That's I, just I never had. What about you, Dom? Is you watch a lot of rugby? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's it's weird because if we if we play on a Saturday, I like to watch the Friday night game. But then if there's a game on a Sunday, I don't really want to know. I want to just leave it. So, yeah. No, I do watch watch it when it's on, but try to sort of switch off as well if I can. 
Oh, in which case, I apologise, Chris. So you can both answer this question as back yeah, rugby. Yeah, I can tell you what. In the second half of my career, I didn't watch much rugby. What um, as back rowers? What are your thoughts on the new breakdown interpretation that the referees have been using in the Super Rugby? There you go. Put you on the spot now. You said you watch it, Chris. Yeah, I don't watch Super Rugby. Um, <laughs> It's not well, we had um, we had uh, one of the refs, Carl Dixon, come in uh, yesterday, no Tuesday, sorry, to to sort of ref some of some of training, and I just think it's it's I don't know what you think, Robert, but it's very quick. I think especially if you're the jackler going to get the ball, you don't really have to. They were saying before that you'd have to survive the clean out to get it, whereas now if you're on the ball and you're sort of showing that you're going to lift it, then they're, they're willing to give you the penalty straight away, almost. Um, so, yeah, I think you're, we'll see a lot more penalties given a lot quicker than we did before for Jacqueline. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it goes in the Premiership. I haven't really watched much Super Rugby in terms of like how it's been ref there, but in terms of what we were being ref in training, I think it's going to be quite different, actually. OK. Um... While you're while you're talking, Dom has got a question. What was it like for to be an Englishman playing in Wales? Um, yeah, it was alright to be fair because at, at the university um, there was quite a few English boys as well um, that were there, so it was, it was quite good. And all the Welsh boys were very accommodating, so that was good. But yeah, playing playing in the Welsh Championship um, is a different style of rugby. Um, let's just say that. Um, but yeah, I guess it made me toughen up a little bit, uh, going from school rugby straight into to adult rugby in, in Wales. But yeah, no, three years that I look back on with uh, fond memories. Um, and then just, just a couple, a uh, couple for you, Robbo. One, um, I think you may have been thrown under the bus by, um, by Conan because he did one of these recently with uh, Jordan Turner Hall, George Lowe and Connor. Um, Chris, this is the question. I'll read it word for word. It's not mine. Ollie Cohn told a story about you, a night out, a very expensive expensive bottle of champagne in your mum's credit card. Is it true? There's truth in it. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit drunk, a bit naive, and I, um, yeah, spent far too much one evening. Let's leave it <laughs> that, shall we? <laughs> and when you had to pay, all you had was your mum's credit card. It's a great, it's a lovely end to the story. Um, and then, over the years, which games, which Quinns games would stand out for you that you couldn't believe came away with the result when you didn't think there was a chance? Um, they kind of pulled, pulled victory from the jaws of defeat. Uh, well, um... I mean, I suppose the most famous one ever would be Stade Francais in 09. Yeah, Stade Francais. Drop goal. Yeah. I mean that was that's pretty pretty incredible stuff from Snapper knocking it over, um, and you you actually look back to the year we won it, and there was a couple of highlights and and stuff on Instagram like you said, and it's amazing how many games we won in like the last couple of minutes, and you have a little bit of luck, and to be successful you need a bit of luck like that, and you need a bit of determination to to get the whole way through, and you kind of forget those little things really add up. Um, and they're games which you probably don't remember and they're probably not going to be on highlight wheels or anything like that, but it's so important. But in terms of dramatic finishes to games, yeah, that, that Stade Francais game at home, uh, 27, ga- uh, 27 phases with snappers, two attempts at a drop goal and nailing it in the horrendous conditions. Um, I think it was probably the most dramatic one we've had at the Stoop. Yeah, there's one that sticks out for me and I think it was the first game of the season the year, the season after we won the Prem. So it had been 2012, 2013. Played Wasps in the season opener at Twickenham. And we were something like 25 points down at half-time. Yeah, we're like 44, Four or five tries in the first half. And we scored like 30 unanswered points in the last 30 minutes. And Guesty scored under the post. I think he like charged down a kick or something. Um... And we won something like 43-37, first game of the season. I I don't know if it was 43-37, but it was something ridiculous like that. Um, And that was probably, again, as a knock-on of the belief that we had after what we'd achieved before that. And then actually, the first half of that season, we went unbeaten again for like six or seven games or something. It was probably off the back of that. Um, 
last two questions for both of you guys. Um, firstly, do you have any pre-match rituals um, that you do, or that you've that you have done, or that you do now? I like to have a bath the night before a game. I think it relaxes me, helps me sleep. Annika, Annika bubble bath. Annika bath, yeah. Get the muscles, get the joints going. Um, I like to go through the plays in my head the night before a game, whether it's lineouts or whatever, strategy like that. Um, yeah, they'll probably be my two. Um, yeah, I'm not a big one for, for sort of pre match rituals. I think, yeah, you know, sometimes if I'm a bit unsure, I'll look over a few bits and look over a few footage from training and stuff but apart from that I just like to, to listen to sort of chill chill music and just stay as relaxed as possible really and just enjoy it nice um, no, all then, about that, actually what I used to do I think for about it must have been something like 13 years of my career I had spaghetti bolognese every night before a game I think and it was it wasn't even good spaghetti bolognese it was like Dalmio <laughs> um, yeah it was and then for some reason I just completely stopped it and look, I had that every now and then but yeah for, I reckon for about 13 years constantly from going from school straight through um, yeah, it was my thing but yeah no more um, and then last one um, outside of rugby who's the most famous person you've got on your, you've, you've got on your mobile phone it's probably one for Robbo let's be honest yeah. Oh God, bloody no one. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I've got I've got a couple of people. I've been lucky enough to go to some nice, nice things and meet some good people. Um, you you keep it you keep it to yourself, Chris. You keep it to yourself. So. I've got Mark Lambert. Um, who's a big rugby man? I don't know. Charles Dance. I met him. Um, got to know him a little bit. Did uh, the World Cup advert back in. A while ago, but yeah, I've got I've got some okay ones. Very nice. I'm what about sure you? Uh, what about me? Um, I went to school with Simon Bird, Will from the In Between Us. So you keep yeah. Uh, he's a good <laughs> he's a good mate of mine. Yeah. <laughs> Bring, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Think Lammy was probably one of those guys in that carrying a briefcase at school. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely would have been in that gang, I think. Um, yeah, so he's a mate of mine from school. Um, and then a cu couple of questions for me. Uh, what prompted your switch from tight head to loose head? Wow, that's someone who's followed the club for a long time. Uh, I wasn't that good at tight head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I was okay as a tight head. I actually wish I'd moved to loose head when I joined the academy as, a, as an 18-year-old rather than waiting till my early 20s to do that. Um, I was just more suited to play in the position um, in, from a scrummaging point of view and also um, a bit easier to get around the park uh, as a loose head than it is as a tight head. Although modern players like Sink challenge that. Um, and yeah, Paul, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come and visit uh, Harlequin's visually impaired uh, team at some point when uh, we are in a position to be able to do that. Um, of course I will. Um, I think on that note um, I will try to get through as many of the questions as we can um, we've also got a really uh, really really generous bid um, on on the chat for Alex's shirt so thank you very much for that that's really kind um, raising valuable funds for the Quinns Foundation um, I think we're going to draw it to a close there so thank you so much Robbo thank you so much Domers for giving your time really appreciate it thank you so much everyone the silent masses out there that we can't see um, thanks for coming tonight thanks for supporting the foundation and thank you for your continued support of the club in what's been pretty challenging times for everyone in the last few months so um, I'm no longer one of the players but I can tell you that the players don't don't take it for granted for one second. So thank you very much for your continued support and um, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thomas. See you, mate. Bye-bye.